Outside the principal post and telegraph offices throughout the Dominion, and featured also in the daily newspapers, will be found a list of ships at sea which are in radio communication with the coast stations operated by the New Zealand Post and Telegraph Department. Behind this prosaic announcement of ships within wireless range lies the romantic story of modern wireless telegraphy. In the early days of radio, effective communication was limited to 200 miles during the day and about double this distance at night. The rapid advance in radio engineering and the increased use of shortwave transmission has, however, greatly enlarged the range of contact. Until today, there is practically no limit to the distance over which a message can be transmitted. Ships all over the seven seas are in daily contact with the New Zealand radio stations. From the Mediterranean, the Atlantic and the Pacific, messages come. From the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the China Seas, romantic place names that spell adventure. Radio has brought to the backcountry a swift and reliable contact with the other side of the world. Roughly carved roads that wind down through the ferns and gullies of New Zealand were once the only means of access to the fertile plains, where snug little homesteads nestle under the guardianship of distant hills. Here, in the depths of the country, 23 miles from the nearest telegraph office, we can follow the progress of a simple radio message from the time it is first conceived in the mind of the sender. Forty years ago, this was only a two-room shack on land that was rough and hungry. Farming it is easy work now, or it would be if young Jack hadn't gone off to England. Still, don't you worry, Dad. The lad will come back. Let's see, what's the date? Jack should be in England pretty soon. Sakes alive, it's the boy's birthday today. Jack's never out of his mother's thoughts for very long. Dad seems to be having a bright idea. Why shouldn't they send the young scamp birthday greetings by radio? Yes, mother, that's what it says. Ships within wireless range. Say, Dad, that son of yours has expensive tastes. Queen Mary, indeed. What next? Yes, Dad, it's only too true. Time marches on. But there are compensations. For nowadays, we can send a radio message from here across the world. It's quite simple, so let's follow Dad's message and see what happens to it. Here's the other end of that telephone conversation, the local post office. Uh, pardon me, I should have said the nearest post office. The local operator accepts the message by telephone and records it on the usual telegraph form. Pardon the gentleman's surprise, but this is only a country office and he doesn't get a radio for the Queen Mary every day. After writing out the message, he checks it back with the sender to make sure it has been correctly received. At the earliest opportunity, the greeting that is shortly to be flashed to the other side of the world is transmitted by Morse to the nearest provincial center. In case you should think otherwise, this is normal transmission and not nervous excitement. The operator at the provincial office receives the message on a Morse sounder. It now goes to another operator for retransmission to the main telegraph center. In this office, our message is transmitted by the teleprinter, an ingenious device whereby high-speed transmission is possible in both directions at once. The message is typed on a standard keyboard which punches holes on a narrow tape instead of printing letters. This perforated tape passes through a transmitter, sends electrical impulses to the receiving station. In the main telegraph room at the GPO Wellington, thousands of messages are transmitted and received daily. With incoming messages, the electrical impulses are automatically converted into Roman characters onto a narrow strip of gummed paper. Here is our message as it is received at Wellington. All the operator has to do is gum the message on a standard form as it comes from the machine, and it is ready for transmission to one of the coast stations. The New Zealand Post and Telegraph Department operates three such stations for the transmission of radio messages. Radio ZLW Wellington is situated high up on Tinakori Hill, a point that commands a fine panorama of the city, spreading itself over the surrounding hills. Inside the operator's room at ZLW, 
Men are continually on watch, sending and receiving messages from ships and shore stations all over the globe. Their work is arduous, exacting and exciting, and accuracy is essential. From here are sent out weather reports, shipping news and other topical information. Radio telephone communication is established with lonely islands in mid-ocean. Possibly their only contact with the outside world is a friendly voice that emanates from this room. Here, indeed, is one of the nerve centers of New Zealand. This particular watch is conducted on the 600 meter medium frequency wave band and is a constant insurance for the safety of life at sea. For 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this radio set is constantly in use, searching for contact with ships of the seven seas. On this wavelength, all stations cease ordinary transmission for three minutes in every half hour to allow distress calls to receive priority, and the clock is marked as a reminder. Alongside the 600 meter operator is the aviation panel, where men are in constant touch with airports and all aeroplanes equipped with radio. As commercial planes working to a fixed schedule pass overhead, the operator speaks to the pilot by means of radio telephone, giving weather reports and other vital news. Other airports are contacted and valuable information is collected and passed on to airport officials throughout New Zealand. Still another operator at Radio ZLW is the shortwave operator for distant reception and transmission. And it is from here that our radio message sets out on the last stage of its journey. It arrives by telegraph from the GPO and is immediately handed to this operator. His contacts are many and varied, and from time to time he finds it necessary to change his tuning coils in order to, uh, to obtain a different set of wavelengths. The set he operates is a specially sensitive shortwave receiver, which provides maximum efficiency for contact with ships in all parts of the world. Every vessel has international radio call letters assigned to it, and at a prearranged time, the operator commences to call the required vessel. The telegraph key controls a powerful transmitter situated in another building some little distance away in order to prevent interference with reception. In this room are a number of different types of transmitters, each supplying the energy for the various radio services controlled by the operators in the other building. In addition to those constantly in use, there are spare transmitters that can be brought into service at a moment's notice. The actual amount of electrical energy which is used up in sending our message is equivalent to that used in the average domestic electric radiator. From the transmitter, the energy is delivered to the shortwave aerial by means of a power line. Silent and inactive, the transmitting aerial gives no indication of the multitude of purposes which it fulfills night and day. But on the other side of the world, in the lonely waters of the Atlantic, a ship is constantly on the alert, ready to convert the silence into a sound for human ears through the magic of modern radio. In the wireless cabin of the Queen Mary, a ship's operator picks up his call sign out of a 12,000 mile void. A few adjustments, a brief acknowledgement on his transmitting key and contact is established. As the radio spells out its message from the back blocks of New Zealand, the operator, with an ease born of long practice, transposes it on his typewriter. After acknowledging the message and signing off, he places it in the regulation envelope. A bellboy takes the message and pages the recipient. Only a few moments ago, this message was being written out in Wellington, and yet, here it is on the other side of the world, ready for delivery. The modern marvel that is radio telegraphy has made this miracle possible, and to the comfort of an up-to-date luxury liner, it brings recollections of other times, other places, and other people, telescoping days into minutes, 
and bridging the gulf that separates the countries and peoples of the world. Wherever an aerial mast rears its lonely head to the sky, there stands the outward symbol of the 20th century magic of the radio telegraph service, a monument to man's endeavor and achievement in annihilating space. 